All right, welcome to chapter two. We're going to cover uh, the basics of atomic theory. We won't be getting into quantum mechanics quite yet. We will be getting into quantum mechanics eventually, just not right now. Now, uh, atomic theory is actually pretty darn old. You know, go back to the ancient Greeks, and you know what happens if you take matter and you know you cut it in half, and cut it in half again, and again, and again, and again. You know, eventually, you know, you get down to you know a very tiny thing. Can you cut that in half, or is there some final point? And you know. The matter got divided between two schools of philosophy, the atomists and the dualists. Uh, the atomists were a consistent position. They were always around, um, but they never really won the day. The dualists won out for quite a long time, uh, not least because for about a thousand years there, they were supported by the Catholic Church. Um, but eventually, the atomists did win out. You know, uh, starting around you know 1500 with that thing called the printing press, uh, people started uh, recording information which they had been doing and publishing it which they had not. So alchemy transformed rather rapidly into chemistry. And after a couple hundred years of sharing information, uh, you had a bunch of um, uh, laws. The laws had been noticed. They, they had spent centuries gathering and collating facts, and they noticed some laws. Okay. These are the patterns that they noticed. First off, some substances can be broken down, decomposed, into um, two or more other substances. Decomposition. They can be broken down, chemically broken apart. Other substances cannot be broken down in that way. Uh, second, uh, some substances can combine to form new substances. Okay. And when they do so, they will always combine in whole number ratios. Never more, never less. For example, in the real world, one gram of hydrogen and eight grams of oxygen will always combine to form water. If you put in more oxygen, you'll have water and a little bit of leftover oxygen. More hydrogen, you'll have water and a little bit of leftover hydrogen. All right, uh, some substances... Oh, and by the way, this is the law of definite proportions. Then you have the law of multiple proportions, which says that some substances, like nitrogen and oxygen, can combine in multiple ratios, but they're still whole number ratios. It's the law of multiple portions. And finally, if you have a substance that has been so combined, you can decompose it to recover the original substances. That was the uh, nucleus, as it were, of atomic theory, developed at the end of the 18th century. First, all matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms. That's from Greek. Um, a means un, and tom comes from tomos, which means cuttable. Let's go ahead and clear off some, all right. Atoms come in varieties or kinds, 
called elements. No, not all, but every atom of the same element has the same mass and chemical properties. Different elements have different masses and properties. Atoms of different elements can combine in whole ratios. That's the law of definite proportions to form compounds, different ratios makes different compounds. And that's our law of multiple proportions. And I ran out of room, so I'm going to squeeze it in up here at the top. Matter isn't created or destroyed, only rearranged by chemical reactions. Uh, that is the version of atomic theory that they came up with there at the end of the eight, or yes, of the 18th century. All matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms. Atoms come in varieties called elements. Every atom of the same element has the same mass and chemical properties. Different elements have different masses and different chemical properties. Atoms of different elements can combine in whole ratios to form compounds, or they can form, use different ratios to form different compounds. And those are the laws of definite and multiple proportions. And finally, matter isn't created or destroyed by chemical reactions, only rearranged to make new compounds. Uh, the reason this uh, sort of uh, demonstrates that atoms exist and not, you know, infinitely divisible matter is those two laws at the bottom, the de law of definite proportions and the law of multiple proportions. Um, it really only makes sense um, that they can only combine in whole number ratios. Ratio is based on mass, by the way. They didn't know about uh, uh, other things that we'll talk about later. Um, so they didn't know about... Uh, uh, those things. So they just based it on mass, and it didn't make any sense that you could only get a certain amount, a mass of hydrogen, and a mass of oxygen to make water, um, and it, in, in a certain ratio, unless it was because matter was divided into these uh, tiny little particles. Now, the, this uh, model here isn't, you know, entirely perfect. Um, it got updated and revised over the years as we learned more as we dove deeper into the atom. Uh, we know that... Uh, Atoms of the same element can be different. There are ways for them to be different. Uh, they can have different masses. They'll have the same properties. We know that atoms can be divided. Uh, they can be cut. So the, the name is no longer quite as accurate as it could be. But we ain't changing it. Uh, they, they have, you know, subatomic particles and things like that. And matter, of course, can be created or destroyed. But it uh, is destroyed by being turned into energy, so it's so this so the stuff of the universe is still being conserved, but uh, it's uh, conserved as conservation of energy rather than just conservation of matter. So so so, so let us go over uh, some of the revisions, sort of in order. You know, in the eighteen uh, eighties, we got the electron thanks to you know exploration of electricity. Um, then after that, early 1900s, we got uh, the proton, and immediately after that, the neutron uh, was, like when I say immediately, I mean pretty much at the same time, the neutron was proposed, uh, not discovered until uh, 19, 1932.
2, I believe it was, is when it was discovered. So it took 30 years to discover the neutron, or sorry, to confirm the neutron. It was immediately proposed in like 1902, 1903, alongside the proton. And that gave us, uh, more or less, the uh, modern, modern-ish, modern ethic model of the atom, you know. You have your nucleus, which is where you have your protons and your neutrons. Something like 99.999% of the mass of the atom is found in the nucleus. Almost none of the volume, though, 0.001% of the volume. It is very, very, very tiny. I think housefly in a football stadium. Okay. Okay, that's in, that's what it is in terms of the ratio of the volumes. But that housefly is all of the mass of the entire football stadium. And then you have the electron cloud. That's where you find, of course, the electrons. That's 99 plus percent of the volume, um, nearly zero percent of the mass. Electrons are very, very tiny. They're not massless, but they have very, very small mass compared to protons and neutrons. So the electron cloud has almost all the volume, almost none of the mass. Uh, the nucleus is incredibly small, so that's why uh, they proposed the neutron. They proposed it as a sort of glue to hold the nucleus together. Um, because like charges repel, so all those positive protons packed together into the nucleus must be repelling each other, like, really, really, really hard. So, and the neutrons are there to act as a sort of glue. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the electron, the electron cloud, uh, caused an immediate problem for uh, classical physics because it said that the atom, as it was being proposed, simply couldn't exist. And that led to uh, quantum mechanics in the ensuing decades. So quantum mechanics was the hot topic for uh, chemistry and physics in the early decades of the 20th century. But something else we got out of all this was the uh, concept of the isotope. Because of neutrons. Neutrons act as glue, uh, whereas, let's see, our glue, uh, protons are identity. Okay. And E minus is, you know, the electrons are your personality. Uh, you can gain and lose electrons very easily. Uh, that is chemistry, is the movement of electrons. Um, every atom of a certain element has the same number of protons. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that is where early atomic theory got it right. It's not that they're all the same, it's that they all have the same number of protons. Okay, All atoms of an element okay, of element they have the same number of protons, but they can have different numbers of neutrons okay. and differing numbers of neutrons means you're talking about different isotopes. So for example, um, carbon dating relies on the presence of carbon 14 versus carbon 12. Uh, carbon 12 has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-14 has six protons and eight neutrons. And over time, this will decay to nitrogen-14 and escape because that's a gas. So that is how they can determine the age of things because, you know, this decay has a very, very regular rate, happens very reliably. So that is where early atomic theory got it wrong. They can differ, but the way they differ is in the number of neutrons. 
And <clears throat> the number of neutrons doesn't really uh, alter your chemistry or your reactivity. It can alter some bits of behavior, and we'll get into that in a little bit later. A little, we'll get into that a little bit somewhat later. But um, it doesn't have a huge impact on uh, chemical behaviors. It can be important, but it's uh, in rarer instances. Protons and electrons are always super important. And that is all I wish to say about atomic theory. So we're going to go ahead and end lecture six there, and we will pick it up again next time.